Great. Thanks for the introduction, and certainly it's an honor and privilege to be part of this seminar. Um, so over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, we'll kind of do a big overview of uh, BT, PVCs, um, go through some of the diagnosis um, and what we can do to help treat these conditions. So I think it's always important to kind of first start with definitions to make sure we're all on the same page when we're communicating about uh, ventricular arrhythmias, in particular PVCs and VT. So PVCs, or premature ventricular contractions, are single extra heartbeats that are coming from the bottom chain of the heart, the ventricles. And so when we're looking at an EKG here, see my laser pointer, we see these QRSs, these narrow beats, so this is a normal heartbeat followed by this little wider, taller PVC. And this patient getting a PVC sort of every other beat, a term called bigeminy. PVCs are common. They can happen in people with normal hearts, as well as people with structurally abnormal hearts. Uh, generally, uh, we kind of describe them as benign in the sense that they don't cause people to have heart attacks, strokes, die suddenly. Some people have a lot and don't have any symptoms. Some people have a lot and they have lots of symptoms, and some of those symptoms include palpitation, fluttering their chest. Uh, if you're having a high burden, and so burden being 5, 10, 15, 20 percent, it could lead to feeling fatigue, tired, lack of energy. And generally, the reason we treat these are for people who have symptoms. Um, for people with ARVC, you know, it comes with a little bit more of importance. And this is actually based on uh, work here from our group showing that when you have a high burden of PVCs, particularly when you have spikes in your PVCs, this is an important marker to be looking for because then the risk of developing ventricular tachycardia, and I'll describe that in the next slide, it's a little bit higher. And so this is data from, once again, our group here showing that here in this top dark blue, if you have PVC spikes, so a big spike in the percentage of PVCs you have on your halter, as well as some non saint BT, your risk of having a ventricular tachycardia event is a little bit higher compared to people who do not have any PVC spikes. So, so once again, importance of why we do these sort of yearly monitors, halter monitors to assess the burden to really kind of see how the disease state is doing at that time. Ventricular tachycardia is different in that this is a sustained abnormal heart rhythm coming from the ventricles. Uh, to, we define it as a heart rhythm greater than 100 beats per minute. And rather than having these individual PVCs, what we're looking here in this EKG is this wide QRS, now you're having it all the time. So it's a sustained, fast heart rhythm problem. Now this is different in the sense that this is associated with pretty severe symptoms. If it's sustained, feeling lightheaded, dizzy, passing out. And the worst case scenario, particularly when it goes really fast and then generates a ventricular fibrillation, can lead to sudden cardiac death. So these are sort of things that we're trying to um, diagnose and minimize and re-stratify to kind of prevent these from happening. So what causes VT and ARC? And so I kind of break things down to two different phases. There's kind of the early phase of ARVC, where there's a high prevalence of very fast, very rapid ventricular tachycardia. Um, typically, this is triggered by exercise. And so when you're exercising, you have a higher burden of these ventricular tachycardia events. Um, we see this actually in our EP lab. And so if you were to take somebody who has ARVC and you actually give them adrenaline, kind of a medication called isopro, isoproteranol, you're actually able to induce these PVCs and these ventricular tachycardia events just from the medication itself. So this is kind of a very high sympathetic activity uh, that we see. And fortunately, you know, beta blockers are very effective during this early phase of um, ARVC. What we're looking at here is somebody who came in uh, with VT who was sort of in this early phase and they underwent uh, an EP study and VT ablation. Um, and so this is an electrical anatomical map. And I'm going to show you a couple of these images throughout the course of this talk. Um, so this is actually your heart, the way we look at it in our EP lab. Uh, we create what's called a voltage map. So with our catheters, um, it has electrodes. We actually have measured a voltage within the heart itself and say, is this normal or is this abnormal? So all this purple is actually normal, healthy voltage tissue. 
We're looking at the right ventricle here. So to orient you, this is sort of the apex or the tip of the heart. Back here is where the valve plane would be. And so this is uh, somebody who has a diagnosis of ARVC based on um, genetic um, testing uh, with VT, but their voltage is, is normal. And this is a little bit different compared to people who have a later onset of more advanced ARVC. So what we're looking at now here is that the same sort of orientation of the heart, this is the right ventricle. This is actually the epicardium of the right ventricle. Once again, we're looking in here at the apex. Here is the valve here, and now this is a lot different. You see a lot of red, a lot of green, a lot of yellow, um, and this signifies scar. So this is lower voltage when we put our catheters up, and so this tells us there's lots of fat in this region, lots of scar, compared to the more healthy uh, purple-pink region here. And so the VT that we see in the later onset ARVC is more scar-mediated, um, so it could happen, you know, with exercise, but also could be happening even at rest without any sort of kind of clear precipitin or triggers. Um, there's recurrent sustained VT, and this is the kind of population is more, uh, you treat more, most likely with things more than beta blockers, what we call antiarrhythmic drugs, and I'll kind of go through a few of those, as well as catheter ablation, which can be effective in terms of managing this stage of ARVC. And I know um, a couple of speakers already kind of talked about the importance of exercise in terms of the progression of ARVC. You know, um, and this is the reason why we see a lot of patients who come in with VT are, especially when they come at a young age, um, they are high-level athletes. So the exercise um, over time increases the pressure, increases the myocardial stretch within the RV itself. That leads to scarring, to fibrosis, and this is clearly the substrate that's responsible for the ventricular arrhythmias. So how do we manage people who develop uh, VT, PVCs? Um, it breaks things down to a non-invasive strategy as well as invasive approach. So we always like to do non-invasive things first because of the lower potential risk uh, when you start doing that. Beta blockers are the mainstay of therapy for uh, most patients with ARVC or any sort of actually um, kind of cardiomyopathy who has ventricular arrhythmias. Beta blockers decrease the sympathetic activity drive within the body itself, um, and particularly with ARVC, which is triggered by increased sympathetic activity. This is really kind of the most important medication to, to be on. For those who um, continue to have episodes despite being on beta blockers, then there are what we call antiarrhythmic drugs, and there's different classes of those sort of drugs. The first line is flecainide. So flecainide is a, a class one medication. It's a sodium channel blocker. It's really great at suppressing PVCs. Um, and so especially within sort of this early kind of inflammatory phase, flecainide is a really great drug. If you Google flecainide, you'll probably see a lot of you know, warning signs about people who have structural heart disease and not using flecainide. But there's been uh, years now of experience, a number of publications from you know, our group as well as others showing the safety and efficacy of flecainide in people with ARVC. And so, um, so this is a great first-line drug to, to use. Uh, for those who continue to have episodes despite flecainide, may not tolerate the drug itself, um, Sotolol is another medication. It's a different class of a, of a drug that's also been used to suppress ventricular tachycardia. And then finally, amiodarone. It's probably the most effective drug that we have, but it does come with lots of long-term side effects, which makes it not an ideal first-line agent. Uh, but certainly, if it needs to be used, and it is a good medication in terms of suppressing VT. And then for those who continue to have episodes despite being on medications, or who don't tolerate being on medications, then we have our invasive strategy. I put in ICDs here, you know, not because it treats VT, but it's important for you to have an ICD if you have ventricular tachycardia, because this is what prevents sudden cardiac death. Uh, but what we want to do is for you not to use the ICD. What's great is we implant an ICD, and it just sits there and just kind of washes you and doesn't do anything, because what we want to do is prevent ICD shocks and ICD therapies. And for that, we have catheter ablation, and then I'll talk a little bit about what a catheter ablation procedure entails. Um, as well as the uh, sympathectomy, which I'll have a couple of slides at the end of the talk, talking about sympathectomies for the management of uh, VT. So what is catheter ablation? So catheter ablation is a procedure that's been around for decades now, um, initially used to kind of treat a whole host of kind of uh, different arrhythmias from uh, arrhythmias from the top chambers of the heart, SVTs, as well as ventricular tachycardia. 
And so it's uh, outpatient, it's considered, we usually come in as an outpatient. Um, sometimes people are very sick and they have to be hospitalized and do it as an inpatient. But it's something that's done under general anesthesia. You come into the electrophysiology laboratory, we get you under anesthesia, and we insert catheters into the vein in the leg, the femoral vein. And that vein courses straight to the heart itself. And so we're able to position these catheters. These catheters have uh, electrodes that sense the electrical activity of the heart. Um, and the ablation catheter itself delivers radio frequency energy to kind of give heat energy to the myocardial tissue. But we know that, particularly with ARVC, a lot of the substrate, a lot of the scarring is on the outside of the heart. So these wires and catheters are going to the vein and they're on the inside of the ventricle. But we often, and pretty much, pretty much all the time now, we go on the outside of the heart as well. And so here in this middle image, we're looking at a CT scan of a patient. Uh, this patient actually has ARVC. So it's orange to you. This is the sternum, so this is your breastbone coming down right in the middle of your chest. This is the heart. And this big chamber here is actually the right ventricle. So this um, person has an enlarged right ventricle uh, due to their ARVC. And what we do is with the needle, we actually go um, into the space between the breastbone here and the heart. And so we're actually able to, with uh, minimally invasively, put a needle, put a wire, and put a sheath into this space so that we're actually on the outside, on the surface of the heart itself. And so. Um, you know, fortunately, we are a very high volume center. We do a lot of these here at Hopkins and, you know, requires some skill to do it. But once you're able to get into that space, you actually could do things very safely uh, within this part of the heart itself. And then once we were there, and this sort of cartoon shows you um, uh, an ablation catheter. So this is an example of what an ablation catheter looks like. Uh, the tip is about 3.5 millimeters. Um, and so this catheter here is actually in the inside, so the term we use is endocardial. Um, this ablation catheter is on the outside of the heart, and the term we use is epicardial. Um, and here is the substrate, the scar, within the tissue itself. And so you're actually able to apply heat energy to both the outside and inside of the heart to try to eliminate the circuit for ventricular tachycardia. And this is part of the challenge, to be quite honest. You know, the heart is not a piece of paper. It's not flat. It's got some thickness to it. And so uh, oftentimes we need to go on the outside and the inside of the heart to kind of give enough energy to affect the circuit itself. The scar pattern in AREC is very predictable. You know, so once again, this is our electrical anatomical map of the right ventricle. This is uh, an epicardial map, so we're on the surface on the outside of the heart itself. The scar pattern is typically here, um, so this is the lateral inferior wall of the right ventricle, so oftentimes the scar will be here, will be sort of here in the base, and oftentimes extending into the outflow tract itself. So this is a patient with ARVC coming with VT. The purple is sort of the normal healthy tissue. The gray is very dense scar tissue. And this you know, red, yellow is sort of the disease unhealthy tissue. So dense scar tissue is not going to cause VT because the tissue is dead. This is sort of where the problem is, is, sort of this unhealthy sort of tissue where, you know, activity could still occur, um, and this is really kind of the target for our, our ablation. And so what we're looking at here on the right-hand video is uh, a VT. So we actually try to put you into VT during the procedure to identify where exactly in the heart the circuit is coming from. So if you follow this video, this wavefront, and there's some arrows here to kind of guide you, you see the circuit that's going around this region here. And so if you imagine this is a scar, some unhealthy tissue, there's a circuit going around this region. And then we're able to apply heat energy, the radio frequency energy, to that critical isthmus to try to eliminate the circuit. And so all these little red dots here are the ablation lesions that we apply over the heart to eliminate the, um, the VT in the situation. So what's our outcome? So like, how do we do? What, what can you expect when you come in for a VT ablation? So this is a, a, a based on actually a study that was published a couple of years ago now of the Hopkins ARVC ablation experience over 10 years. Um, this is the, the largest contemporary uh, ablation study for ARVC of 116 patients who underwent 166 ablation procedures. Um, you know, given the fact that, you know, oftentimes people are young when they are diagnosed, you know, the average age is about 34 years of age when people had their first ablation procedure. It's an equal mix between men and women. 
Uh, the most common mutation was PKP2, who came in for ablation, about 50 percent. Um, about a third of them had no identified mutation, and then a scattering of the other sort of uh, mutations. The number of ablations per patient. So most people had, you know, one ablation when they came to our center, uh, at our center. But it's not uncommon, and you know, don't be discouraged when you may need more than one procedure to try to get control of the VT itself. Um, and so having multiple procedures is not uncommon um, to kind of get better control of the VT. Our experience over time has grown, and so we're doing more and more VT ablations. And also our approach has changed as well. You know, over the past you know, 10, 15 years, we've come to appreciate once again that the epicardium, the surface of the heart, is where a lot of the substrate is. And so for our VT ablations nowadays, we go straight to the epicardium. You know, before we go to the inside of the heart because, you know, one, it's a little bit safer to do, to be, you know, put your catheters in there. It's a little bit more of a riskier procedure when you go into the epicardium. But over the past, um, you know, 10, 50 years, our experience has grown. We're a lot more comfortable doing so. And you can see we're kind of doing mostly epicardial ablations now for people with ARVC. Sometimes we do have to go in the inside of the heart, um, but an epicardial approach is sort of the standard of our approach nowadays. And our VT-free survival, meaning not having one VT episode requiring any sort of ICD shock, is about 7% at five years after your last procedure. So once again, some people may need multiple procedures to get full control, and so at five years, um, is about 70%, which is actually very good um, compared to a lot of other procedures that we do with an EP for ablation. Um, and so this is a very good sort of uh, outcome. Also, we would like to get do better, and I will talk a little bit about you know why sometimes. The, well, I could mention it a little bit now. You know, the reason I personally why I think our success is not even higher. I think part of it is limitation of our tools. And so when we do ablation procedures, you know, especially when they were first developed, they were developed for you know healthy normal tissue. And so if, you know if I were to do an ex show you an experiment of a uh, greater frequency ablation on a normal piece of tissue, it's a very predictable ablation. You're able to kind of penetrate the tissue, get some really nice lesions, and kind of see what that looks like. When you're ablating on scar and fat, the biophysics are very unpredictable. And part of the limitation for our tools is just that we're not able to ablate or get rid of effectively the circuits that are responsible for VT. And so I think part of the efforts are trying to find other sort of ablation tools, other different modalities to see if we're able to kind of get better penetration to the tissue that's responsible for the VT itself. I think another important metric, honestly, is not you know, freedom from any VT, but the burden of VT that you have. Um, you know, once again, the last slide was saying if you just had one episode, that was considered a failure. But if you actually look at the burden, how much VT you were having before versus afterwards, there's a big reduction in the VT burden. So within our cohort, um, before ablation, there's about you know, almost 11 uh, VT events before the ablation. And afterwards, it was less than you know, 0.5 was the average number of VT events afterwards. And so pretty much everybody had some sort of clinical result. And remember, these are people who already failed medications. And so by the time they come to our VT ablation, they failed medications. And so this is, I think, a really excellent result to have this sort of reduction in the burden of VT. The number of uh, anti drug use also diminishes. And so this is, once again, from the same cohort, showing that the amount of drugs that people are on before versus afterwards is significantly reduced following catheter ablation. Um, and, but then what do we do then when ablation fails? You know, you've, failed, you've been on medications, you're still having VT, you have a couple of ablation procedures, you're still having VT, are there any sort of you know, treatment options that are available to help manage it? And so this is what we call a sympathectomy, something that we are doing more frequently, not only for ARVC, for a bunch of other conditions. Uh, Dr. Ginny Haas, our thoracic surgeon here, who uh, does all of our cases, and she's excellent. And, um, um, and what it is, this is a surgical procedure. It's not an open chest surgery. It's a little cameras that they put on the side of your chest. And what we do is we attack the sympathetic chains. Remember, especially with ARVC, adrenaline increased sympathetic activity is what's the driver for a lot of these VT episodes. And what we've known actually for a couple of decades is that the heart is innervated by these neurons that increase your sympathetic activity. And if you're able to remove the sympathetic chain, 
then we actually know that it actually reduces the amount of PBCs and VT that people have afterwards. And so, um, you know, this is just a, a camera, just actually what they're doing, you know, with little cameras. Um, they go ahead and remove that chain, and this is sort of what it looks like when they take it out. Um, and the outcomes, you know, are they're good afterwards. So this one's in, from our experience here at Hopkins for people with ARVC undergoing sympathectomy. So remember, by this time, you've sort of failed medications, VT ablation didn't really work, so now you're sort of on the next um, therapy. Um, the one-year freedom from any VT is 63%. Uh, similarly, like the VT ablations, we're able to reduce I'm sorry, the amount of antimicrobial drugs that individuals, individuals are on. And I think, once again, importantly, the burden, the amount of VT that you're having following sympathectomy is significantly reduced from before until afterwards. So in conclusion, you know, beta blockers are the cornerstone for therapy for the management of VT. Most ARVC patients respond well to catheter ablation. I didn't show you the data because there really wasn't much to present, but it's actually a very safe procedure. The complication rate in our series actually was less than 1%. There was no major complication, and I think one person had some inflammation after the ablation itself, but they um, um, did well afterwards. Um, epicardial ablation is often needed to get kind of control of the VT. VP procedures are not uncommon, and sympathectomy significantly reduces uh, arrhythmia burden in ARC patients. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much.